I would now like to introduce our distinguished speaker, Pierre Serna, Professor of French Revolutionary History at the Université de Paris 1, Panthéon-Sorbonne. Professor Serna was the last director of the Institut sur l'histoire de la Révolution Française from 2008 until its fusion with the Centre d'Histoire Moderne et Contemporaine in 2016. He remains responsible for the activities of the Institute within the framework of the Center. In this capacity, Professor Serna has continued the tradition established by his doctoral director, Michel Vauvel, of expanding the reach of French revolutionary scholarship beyond the hexagon. He has traveled to many countries and continents, including Australia, where he gave the opening keynote at the Rude Conference in Canberra in 2018. His research has focused on the history of political ideas and practices from the 18th century to the present, including the history of representancy, radical movements, and the extreme center, a term he coined in 2005. He has also written on the history of Atlantic revolutions, the patriot movements, the circulation of ideas, and the history of the animal. As one would expect with such an eminent scholar, his publications are numerous. I'd just like to mention the last three. Comme des bêtes, histoire politique de l'animal en révolution, 1750-1840, published uh, with Fayard in 2017. Then L'extrême centre ou le poison français, 1789-2019, published with Jean Vallon in 2019. And finally, the book on which he is going to speak tonight, Que demande le peuple? 1789, Histoire des Cahiers de Doléances, published by Textuel in 2019. And it is now with great pleasure that I give you my friend, mon ami, Pierre Serna. Thank you, Rafe. Thank you, everybody. It's a mystery of a sad or happy mystery of a virtual congress. I don't know if I speak to 10 or person or 50 brave. Anyway, uh, good afternoon, America, good morning, Pacific, and good evening, Europa, and thank you very much to be here, here to listen to me, and above all, to discuss to me, with me after my first, uh, my little speech. I would want to thank, because uh, it's quite normal, uh, the organizer of this Congress, above all, uh, the Rude Seminar, I belong to the Rude Seminar two years ago, as uh, Rafe Brofard, my friend and colleague, reminded, and it's for me a very great honor as a successor of George Refer to uh, participate to this uh, seminar and to uh, remind one of the three musketeers, uh, George Rude, with uh, Albert Soboul and uh, Richard Cole. And thanks to Rafe to remind also the memory of my master, Michel Vauvel, who died two years ago, and we wanted to record his memory during his, his uh, seminar. I would want also to thank uh, my special thanks to David Smith, who was so gentle, so patient with me, as a French who were uh, never unable to go on, to go out uh, from the 1815 Waterloo Battle, technically speaking, and he was uh, very great for me to give me possibility to show you a few pictures I will present you uh, after. And uh, above all, thanks to all of you who are listening to these uh, few words. Uh, I will introduce my speech uh, without a reflection about the title of my last book. What does French people want in 1789? Of course, it's not a question that I would have uh, asked in the same way 10 years ago, ago 20 years ago, as uh, the basic lesson of uh, uh, Mark Bloch uh, recalled to us. An historian is not only an historian from the past, but it's also an historian from the present. 
And our present uh, gave us possibility to have a, not a single, not a double, but a triple conjunction context, a triple context to ask this question. The first question, the first context is a French context. From two years, we are, except the COVID crisis, of course, and uh, the possibility to put 15 or more than 60 million French people at home. But before we lived each Saturday, a contest movement very strong that we called Yellow Jacket. And uh, it's true that this uh, contest movement uh, has changed the political uh, panel in uh, my country. It has changed so much the panel of the, of the country that for December, for the night of the 31 December 2018, President Macron proposed to French people to organize a consultation nationale. Uh, it was, of course, uh, everybody uh, can rem remind that it seems like uh, quite 200 and more years ago when we said asked for uh, la, la rédaction, the reduction of the Cahiers de uh, Doléance. Of course, it was not the same way, but in each town, in each um, uh, uh, commune of France, there are possibility to write uh, what we want. And uh, at the end, six months later, uh, at the beginning uh, in June uh, 2019, only 10,000 cahiers were written. If we compare at 1789, we can see, we know that uh, in that time, 200 years ago, more than 600 and 65 hundred thousand thousand hundred uh, of cahiers were written for a population of 27 million of French uh, people. So if we make comparison, of course, they are not the same way to express uh, ourselves because net, because internet, because uh, all the uh, possibilities to uh, uh, give his opinion by uh, uh, by uh, internet, change the possibility to make the comparison. But uh, that forced us to understand what kind of politicization was possible, have been possible, has been raised possible uh, during spring 1789. Second reason is a global reason. Uh, 30 years after Bicentenary, perhaps we historian, we have to rethink uh, what was the conclusion of the bicentenary? Uh, the few holders of uh, older of us can uh, remind the Congrès Mondial du Bicentenaire that Michel Lover organized in uh, La Sorbonne. And uh, at that time, it was quite clear, it was quite clear, even if my master was really sad about that, that we have to recognize that critical history was uh, having a great victory in a certain sense, saying that, uh, in fact, uh, history of revolution was now a cold uh, object and uh, the problematic of revolution was over. And we all remember the book of uh, Francis Fukuyama uh, saying that story was uh, over. Uh, in fact, 30 years after, uh, there is not only a globalization or market globalization, there is also a world contestation of this uh, world maker. And not only in France, in Hong Kong, in Chile, in Algeria, in Tunisia, we are waiting rather go on the revolution of Tunisia, in Spain, also in United States for other reasons, but contestation are growing in that moment and we can see that the world government is now obliged to do with this well uh, contestation so strong to uh, make uh, government or government ability uh, using more and more brute force brutality force of our police of uh, all the police of the world and uh, we, historian of revolution, we know perfectly well that uh, when power, when an executive power uses 
police force, it's not only a demonstration of power. It could be a demonstration of sickness. Third, historiographical, historiographical reason that made me, uh, make me uh, give me the wish to uh, write uh, this book. And I would want to pay debt or several debts. Please, David, can we, can, can we see the first slides? Uh, so we, I would want to, to show you uh, my first debt to uh, the books I have used. And uh, perhaps we, we, can, uh, we can see the first slide. Uh, I think my generation has completely changed his point of view of the re revolution with the book of Tim Tackett. It's today a moment to give homage to Tim Tackett and to give homage to Par la Volonté du Peuple, this horrible title in French, because the uh, American title is really wonderful, becoming uh, revolutionary. Um, with reinventing a new narrative from uh, 1789, uh, Tim gave us possibility to uh, understand the improvisibility of history, to reinvent the events and normality of history, to reinvent uh, another way, another social way to understand uh, how uh, so great events as the general stage, the convocation des états généraux could be possible in that time, and above all, invent uh, regarding in quite each uh, departmental archives, uh, not only the official papers, but also the correspondence. And I think that my generation has a great debt to pay to uh, Tim Tackett and uh, my book, Que Demande le Peuple, and my other books, also uh, Antonel and also the Jewettes, are uh, also a tribute, a second tribute to Tim Tackett. I would want to also to thank of the those great works of uh, uh, Markov and Shapiro, because as a historian, they take the linguistic turn, they take the uh, technological turn to rework on the uh, revolutionary uh, demands and to uh, put on the desk uh, what want the French in 1789 to uh, remark after the great work, and I will come back uh, after. Mm, after the great work began to uh, Jean Jaurès with the reprints of the maximum of uh, local uh, cahiers, uh, how it was possible to uh, re ask uh, how to manage uh, with the demands of French people uh, during that time. And two more recent books, two more recent books, uh, unknown book, uh, um, alas, uh, Les Cahiers d'Oléance, une relecture culturelle de Philippe Gratteau. Unfortunately, this book is not so well known, but uh, Philippe Gratteau uh, um, had uh, the idea, very new, very original, to rethink a new way to interrogate the Cahiers d'Oléance. Uh, after the great book of Roger Chartier in 1989, we all thought, we all used to manage the idea, the relationship, the conflictual relationship between uh, La France des Lumières and the revolution. Revolution was, uh, uh, was a son, uh, was daughter of uh, the philosophy des Lumières, or was it an invention of the armed revolutionary to legitimate themselves in their own uh, revolution? In fact, this question, give the impression of a verticality, that the idea that the ideas of uh, the de philosophical debate came from high to the low and uh, penetrate, irrigate, if I can use this metaphor, all France, all territories of France. And on the contrary, uh, uh, Philippe Gratteau explained that there is a consciousness, a political consciousness, who uh, was invented, who appear in the Cahier de Doléance. Even if they are full of autographical error, even if they are full of syntactical error, even if they are full of French error, they explicate the real political reason of contestation. 
I read uh, an example of a little Varetani uh, village, uh, Sanglin Pangui. Demandons que les laboureurs iraient au moulin où bonne leur semblerait. Or oh, they are full of French uh, errors. But anyway, so it's, it's not that which is important. What is important is even if, and that's the word of uh, Philippe Rateau, even if in this sentence, for example, this clear sentence, the word freedom is not used, we can't, as historians, say that liberty is not at the center of this sentence. So that needs a lecture precise of each, if it's possible. Of course, it's not possible for physical force of only one researcher, but that needs a very attentive, renewed lecture to put the concept, the big, the great concept of the philosophy of the Lumière in the concrete, in the concrete contest of the majority of French people. At last, that it's a long introduction, but you understand that we are yet speaking about uh, the debate we will have after. There is this immense, this great book of Jean-Nicolas, La Rébellion Française. Uh, Jean-Nicolas uh, gave us, gave me a uh, possibility to re-understand completely differently the French Revolution. Why? Because uh, it changed completely the narrative of the quiet, of the happy, of the uh, wonderful 18th century, which be quiet, without war, without famine, without too much poverty, without too much contest. It's completely wrong, sustains Jean-Nicolas. He makes a calcul, he makes a mathematic uh, uh, graphic that more than 8,500 uh, contestation explodes in France from long 18th century, from 1661 to uh, 17, uh, 1789. And he demonstrates that after the foreign war, the floor war in 1775, there is a, contest, a permanent contestation in France. And this contestation is so strong that uh, he invented a neologism. And I think that when a historian is obliged to invent a neologism, that describes, that demonstrates that he is in front of a reality that no one saw before. And he invented the neologism, l'intranquillité. In France, we, we have the word la tranquillité. We have la non-tranquillité, but we, do, we don't have the word l'intranquillité. And Jean Collin invented the word l'intranquillité to describe France from 1775 to 1789. So these four books were so important, and I don't pretend, I have to say with great humility, that my book, Que demande le peuple, is not a research book, I say it immediately, but it's try, it's like an essay, to uh, put in a perspective, to put some ideas I will want to uh, resume now uh, to uh, have some discussion uh, with you. Uh, first question is an old question um, that asked uh, the great Ernest Labrousse after the Second World War, when he retried to rebuild the French, uh, great French social history in his great conference he gave in the Sorbonne, uh, quand commence les révolutions, comment commence les révolutions, how begins uh, revolution? And I think that uh, it's a question. It's a question because, uh, from contestation to rebellion, to, from rebellion to uh, revolution, what are the, the paradigms, what are the, the proof who indicate that someone is going to change from a, a radical, uh, from a radical way? Second question uh, that I want to ask, and I uh, thank Rave to have recalled that I am a political historian. I ask, I, I think that political uh, builds the reality. That then does not mean that I uh, uh, don't know the importance of economical uh, power and the social tension of the country. But I think that uh, the superstructure, the post-Marxian superstructure, is very useful to put the world on social tension and to explain uh, 
economic diminution, economic uh, production. So I think I don't use the word l'infrapolitique or la sous-politisation that is being used by few, by few colleagues to uh, when they speak about the contestation during the Ancien Regime. Uh, first, because the person does know, do not know that they are living in Ancien Regime. And then because I think that uh, politics began from below, politics began immediately when there is uh, consciousness, uh, first discourse of arguments who are built, who are uh, built and written and were spoken uh, to explain uh, the opposition between a state of horror, a state of domination, and a collective, take consensus, uh, take his consensus that he is against this kind of mm, domination. Third question, uh, third perspective I would want to sustain in uh, my book is the process of radicalization. Perhaps there is here little, a very little debate with uh, uh, Tim Tucker. Uh, in sense that I remark that the radicalization, it's a world important in that time, uh, radicalization in our time and in that time, radicalization had begun before uh, the revolution. And when you see uh, even in a little village uh, some uh, uh, remarks, you can see that uh, there is some strength, some force, some pause. For example, my great friend Peter McPhee from Melbourne offered me a, a cahier de doléances from a little village from the Pyrenees. Uh, the cahier is only one sentence, only one sentence. Nous ne voulons plus être les esclaves du Seigneur. We don't want to be more slaves of the landlord. There is no slaves in Pyrenees uh, at the end of the 18th century. The, the exaggeration of the world and the very short sentence mean a lot. Means that they do not want, they do not support more the kind of domination that the landlord want to uh, build. And they don't want to explain more. That want to say that all is said in that short sentence. And I think that this form of radicalization that we'll, uh, I will develop uh, after could demonstrate uh, um, this uh, revolution before the uh, revolution. And of course, I think to the great article of my master, Michel Lorel, describing the disorders in the Provence village of Lacoste and Mirabeau, the village uh, du Marquis de Sade and du Comte de Mirabeau, where the disorder, economic disorder of the landlord make the community building his own autonomy in front of the landlord and before the uh, revolution. Um, fourth perspective, I would want to uh, sustain, and we will see that in the picture. It's the way um, uh, that integrate, how we can integrate the new camps of uh, studies. And uh, my naive uh, question, uh, excuse me, but uh, I would want to uh, remind that is, is it possible to put our reflection today of our PhD students in the Cahiers de Doléance? I mean the gender studies, I mean the slave studies, I mean the colonial studies, I mean the Atlantic studies, and for myself, I mean uh, animal studies, and more than that, environmental uh, studies. Of course we can, of course we can. Not of me, because it's a new phenomenon, and because each historian uh, can find what he wants uh, in front of the documents. But because the documents, Speak to uh, these problems, and I will uh, demonstrate or give some example um, after. Fifth question uh, How to make with massive democratization? Uh, I don't know if you uh, agree with me, but I'm very uh, tired in that time with this uh, world who arrive uh, always. In Europe, in the United States, in Brazil, to uh, delegitimate the people who vote for 
persons who are not democrats. And uh, the word populism is arriving from everywhere. And this delegitimate clearly is a democratization, the massive democratization who uh, arrived in 1789 and not only in 1789, in other moments of the story. I think that uh, there is a real uh, democratization uh, at that moment. And we don't have to, to make error and to imagine that uh, there was the origin of populism and we make the error of totalitarianism that makes the uh, uh, critical uh, school. Well, it's my opinion. Uh, first of all, of all um, I would talk about uh, I would talk about uh, methodology, uh, global methodology, and uh, particular uh, method methodology. Um, global methodology um, is uh, to uh, take again the discourse against. Uh, the global uh, interpretation, uh, the global interpretation of uh, the Cahiers de l'Ordinance. In the 1890, uh, we have a conservative uh, historian uh, like Tan, like uh, Sorel, who uh, were explaining that uh, Cahiers de l'Ordinance were like fake news, uh, they were not so just. Uh, because they are manipulating by uh, bourgeois, uh, in, for example, Coudero de la Clos, who write Cahiers uh, de for uh, more than uh, 50 villages along the Loire, uh, being the secretary of the Duc uh, d'Orléans, bien uh, François de Neuchâteau in Lorraine, writing Cahiers uh, de for more than uh, 50 uh, villages, um, uh, as uh, we know. In fact, it was a false effect, as we call in France. It was a lecture of the eight first Archives Parlementaires, volume of the Archimentary, uh, uh, Archimentary uh, Parliamentary Archives, uh, who are the synthesis of the 400, the last 400 uh, Marie Chaussé, who were in charge to uh, make the synthesis of the 1,200 sous Marie Chaussé uh, et sous uh, Femme Chaussé who were in charge to make the synthesis of the more than the 30,000 parish of France uh, who have been uh, united, united the first and the third Sunday of March 1789 to uh, express their demands to uh, to the king. So um, if we stay only on this eight first volume, of course, we have a false impression. But if we make the effort to go to the prints of the Jean Jaurès collection and to regard in the uh, departmental archives, but also in the national archive, uh, I was very grateful to uh, conservators who helped me to choose the documents in this book because we are choose completely inedit uh, page manuscripts. And for example, a manuscript from more than 80 pages written by women, women from Besançon. Uh, I will uh, come back on this uh, cahier des femmes de uh, Besançon. Um, and we have to see also the very concrete local uh, example. Uh, it's my pleasure to read to you uh, the text who make a lot of commotion, emotion to uh, Jean Jaurès. It was uh, the text of the village de Vert, uh, a village from Normandy. Nous avons l'honneur de vous présenter, nos seigneurs, que notre paroisse n'est composée que de 16 particuliers et deux fermiers, 18 habitants. Il n'y en a qu'un seul qui possède une maison et trois arpents de terre. Pour les autres habitants, ils sont logés dans de petites chaumières toutes simples, sans avoir de quoi loger ni bestiaux, ni même des volailles. Il suffit que nous achetions tout ce qu'il faut pour notre subsistance. Voyez quelle est la misère d'une paroisse pareille. Que demandent les paysans Une fondation d'une somme de 100 livres pour avoir un maître d'école. Cela nous mettrait, dans le cas d'élever nos enfants, dans la crainte de Dieu et dans l'instruction qui est due à l'homme. Et le restant servirait à soulager la paroisse en cas d'accident, comme incendie, ravagement d'eau pour soulager les veuves 
et orphelins et les malades. It's very interesting because it's better than long discourse and it gives me possibility immediately to arrive uh, to um, the end of this first presentation. We have in this little text at the end quite uh, intuition that I was explaining before, uh, explaining the very context, the very reality of the context in which they live. They speak yet about politics because more than the poverty, more than the uh, uh, lamentation, what kind of things they want? A master for the children, and they want some money to defend themselves, life, uh, health, health care, of course, because they are afraid of fire, they are afraid of too much rain, and they are afraid to be sick. So it's sort of a social security, they ask. And it's very important to understand that only 18% so poor in Normandy are able, are perfectly able to ask them, not only uh, for themselves, but for the future of their of their children. So if we come, if we go back, the second and the third idea, like synthesis, I would want to say it's have an analysis of the crisis politic in 1789 and giving also, uh, of course, uh, all right that uh, Tim Tackett demonstrates. Uh, it's true that there is a crisis, but it's wrong that uh, the, the king, uh, he says, is only in position of uh, great weakness at this moment. I think that all the country, it's a great coup, a great coup d'etat, a successful a great coup d'etat because we don't have to see uh, as all the books of history saying that from 1614, the death of Henri IV, there is no reunion des états généraux. It's not the good chronology for me. I think uh, better that uh, from 1749 and the tentative, the try of Machaut d'Armouville to uh, reform the tax in France, then from Bertin, then uh, from uh, Turgot and from Calonne, there are a real tentative to reform the tax in France. And we can see that one of the most important demand of this Cahiers uh, uh, de Doléance are finally the fiscal politics, the fiscal uh, politi political of French monarchy at this moment. And the fiscal political uh, put us in a few perspectives. Uh, three perspective, I think. First, the great, the great uh, uh, concept of the 1789 year, more than equality, is uh, freedom. Liberty is a great question. What kind of liberty uh, was, uh, will be the debate? And here is a great book of Ralph Goffin, the great demarcation, has demonstrated that the freedom was a real sense of the night of the 4th August, making the great opposition between public domain and private domain without with the question of uh, liberty. The second question of the liberty is the commerce liberty. The book of Paul Chony uh, a few years ago demonstrates that it was impossible to understand French uh, history without Atlantic history, Atlantic trade. And the third, uh, uh, of course, uh, thing who gave possibility to understand France at that moment. It's a battle from France and England for mondial, uh, global hegemony. But the thing I remark, and uh, perhaps more original, it's contrary to a lot of historians, I don't see a united kingdom. I don't see a united nation, of course. The word nation is everywhere. Of course, the world uh, constitution is everywhere. And of course, there is a demand of unification of law and justice. That does not mean, that does not mean for me that there is a wish of create a, a centralized kingdom. All the country. I have the impression that province, that region, wants to be uh, governed, governed by themselves. I have the impression that the great demand of the Cahiers de Doléance is the constitution of the United Kingdom 
of France. And perhaps it's the invisible story of France. It's the unsuccessful revolution that a few months ago is going to explode because she is going to fail to build a federal kingdom. I think it's a great, the more original idea I read in this career is to create, because the United States are not so far, to create a federal kingdom. And it was for a lot of nobles, a lot of bourgeois, possible to imagine this kind of France. Uh, if we can see the next slide uh, of the utopic uh, map of France, uh, we can see, uh, in fact, uh, a utopic, oh yes, thank you, David. Uh, it's a utopic representation of France. But this utopic representation of France can demonstrate a uh, thing very important. Uh, it was at the moment in November 1789 when deputies imagined the departmentalization of France and it was, uh, of course, impossible to build the, this car. But it was a representation, the geographical, the geopolitical representation that it was possible for French people to imagine a possibility to divide France and to divide equality uh, of France with liberty for each uh, French people to, uh, uh, to uh, participate to the own government, to the own local uh, government. And to finish my little exposition, uh, I would want uh, for the few minutes uh, to uh, show you or sh see with you uh, some pictures. Uh, as uh, Richard Tolls uh, explained to us in his wonderful uh, books about ephemera during the revolution and the visual culture during the revolution, uh, I would want to uh, give my thanks to Michel Ovel to uh, and demonstrating uh, by new slides a few images that uh, French people have seen. Not, of course, all French people, but if we can see the other slides, uh, I would comment uh, quickly uh, the, the few slides I chose uh, for you. Well, the caricature, uh, of course, where it belongs to uh, political discourse at this moment and uh, pictorial, visual uh, discourse. Uh, belong to uh, French uh, people, and uh, by this moment, war uh, papers uh, belongs uh, to the political culture, and we will see uh, here the classical representation uh, of the debt national, uh, and the clear uh, idea that everyone had to pay uh, the tax, not only uh, in function, uh, not only uh, uh, in function, but progressively uh, also. Next slide, if it's possible. Well, yes, uh, it's very interesting because it's a question of slavery. Uh, I was so surprised to see more than 100 times only in the 400 uh, uh, in the eighth uh, volume of the Archives Parlementaires, uh, using the, the word slavery, not referring, not only referring to the colonial uh, state. Uh, uh, in fact, what is important? It's important because uh, the word slave began to be banalized in the discourse of the uh, political fight. And uh, I found near Reims a little village who says that they were in the same situation eight years ago that the poor Africans are in some French colonies in that moment. That want to explain that they are in a dialectical historical uh, movement and that uh, want to explain that they are in solidarity with these uh, slaves and it's very important to uh, uh, remain that the abolition in the kingdom of slavery, as the first sentence demonstrates, was in the brain of uh, a lot of French. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, uh, we spoke a lot about collectivism, uh, collectivity, plurality, uh, consciousness of mass, and I uh, read, in fact, differently a lot of Kagi. I uh, remark that individualism, own person, 
uh, own body were at the center of the preoccupation of each French to defend themselves, to defend their own person. And I think that it's important because um, we can see here form of rupture. We have uh, the political of representation, which would be so important a few years, a few weeks uh, after uh, when in May the uh, Etats Généraux would be happen, and the representation of the peasant who belongs to community, knows that they have their own personality, their own rights. And I think that this personalization of each French is an important theme to understand also the change of sensibility as uh, David Garriac explained to us in his wonderful book. Next slide, please. David is, ah, thank you. Oh, one of the great, one of the great document I, I uh, not discover, but I rediscover. Uh, the Butcher of Marseille, not so well known for their, uh, for their delicateness, we are going to say. It's a wonderful, wonderful page of economic politics. They understand that if the poor can't eat meat, can't pay the meat, it was a, uh, uh, not possibility for them to develop their industry of butchery. So they explained that uh, eating only bread, the poor person can't participate to the prosperity of the uh, kingdom. So the butcher explained that everybody had to pay a lot of each own part of tax to uh, give possibility to, to, poor, to poor people to have the sufficient money to uh, eat also meat. It's the first for me consciousness of uh, the growth of the collective richness as a possibility to give richness to all the kingdom. Next slide, please. Yes, this slide is important and perhaps uh, uh, one of the most important because uh, it's a Clear, clear representation of the real context of the real object of the revolution. French Revolution, les cahiers de doléances, are not abstract, idealist, are not a uh, concept. They are full of very, very uh, realistic, pragmatic uh, demands. And I think that the more pragmatic demand, and uh, one part of the book of Ray Beaufort, The Great Demarcation, demonstrates this uh, very, very strongly is the need of hunting. Uh, perhaps it's shocking for us uh, as uh, ecological uh, citizens, but uh, summer of 1789 was a great massacre of uh, beasts, was a great uh, massacre of uh, beasts. Uh, I remind a uh, memoir of the master of a little village in the north of France, who explained that he knows that after the 5 August 1789, the abolition of feudality was equal for him. He writes this in his uh, little paper. It was a possibility to hunt freely. And uh, at the end, in September, he says that he is sick because he has eaten too much eat as, as the other men, as the other families of the village. The hunting was uh, the real victory for more than 75% of the Frenchmen. And if you see the novel of Honoré de Balzac, Honoré de Balzac doesn't write novel, he writes a wonderful documentary on the first French of the 19th century, Les Paysans, in 1846, who uh, was published uh, post from a Boston way. You can see that uh, the occupation of wood, the occupation of hunting was a uh, Great, the more explosive uh, thing of uh, relation and tension, social tension between landlords, new properties, and the peasants. Uh, here you have also a patriarchal representation extraordinary from the dog to the gun, and between them, the good boy and the good father. It's a representation very strong of the masculinity, of the representation of the, this. Uh, peasant power. Next slide, and perhaps uh, last, or perhaps last. Oh, 
I have to go fast. Uh, I, I would want to, to finish with uh, last slide, perhaps, to give possibility to have a discussion. Oh, no, no. Uh, uh, yes, this slide. Please stop on this slide. Uh, this slide is very important because it's one uh, be before. Yes, yes. Thank you, uh, David. Excuse me. Uh, this slide is very important. For what reason? Uh, because we have only two liters, so it's very few, but like Carlo Ginzburg explained to us, it's enough to have one document to, uh, to uh, give possibility to say that reality was uh, perfectly uh, well known. Uh, in this document, uh, we have uh, uh, a proof that uh, a black Spartacus uh, was possible in uh, the colonial uh, empire. Uh, in this letter, we have a slave who explains that reform is impossible, that the slow way to emancipate black people and above all to abolish violence against strong violence against slaves is not a good way. And it's like uh, emancipation, like uh, uh, Bernardin de Saint Pierre in his Utopia 2440, a dream if it's possible, or the call to a Spartacus Noir by Diderot in the Histoire des Deux Indes. Uh, we have here the clear consciousness that a revolt, a black revolt, that a slave revolt is going to appear. We are in 1789 and we well known that in two years after, in 1791, in Saint-Domingue, the revolt will explode. Next slide, please. Yes. Uh, the end. We can see that it's quite the end, and not only uh, the end, the end or, or the beginning, uh, as you want, or the continuation of the great book of Jean-Nicolas. Uh, it's a dialectical report from rebellion, cahier de doléances, and revolution. And uh, here we can see uh, people with arms, and with these people in arms, we can see this woman in arm in the center of the uh, in, of the picture. The way for me to speak about this uh, cahier of equipage from uh, written from the woman of Besançon, I spoke. Uh, before, uh, it's very important because uh, it's a way to introduce the invisible in the story. Uh, recently, I uh, write a preface, a long preface to uh, 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 the essay of Richard Corb, Death in Paris in 1795, and I was very interested as uh, Richard Corb by the invisibility, the process of invis invisibility in uh, history. And um, in this cahier of uh, this uh, page of the woman of Besançon, uh, they ask this woman, this woman asks possibility for them to manage the family budget, equality by equality with men, stimulating their virtue, stimulating their possibility to manage the home economy, the home, uh, the money of the couple and to demonstrate the possibility to explain that the family as a little country, as a little country, is the first step of the political equality. And we can see with this woman who uh, has it done, that uh, there is also, even with minority, possibility to be reared from another way, uh, the dialect dialectical uh, construction of the political revolution from the contestation to the rebellion, to the rebellion, to the reduction of the case de Léance, and finally to uh, the la prise d'armes, uh, which symbolize the power of the police. Last demand, what are doing the power? What are doing the governments during that time? I find these two pictures which are very strange or very uh, uh, similar. They seem different, but they are similar. In front of the crisis, there is a public political show of the power. The public political show of the power who create the great racines of populism. What does it mean by populism? I mean that in these two pictures, Louis XVI, uh, 
give charity, we are in winter 1788. And in fact, they take the most poor of person of the, uh, of the uh, uh, region de de France uh, to express the charity of the first person of the state. During the winter 2018, uh, President Macron uh, made publicity. It's not a uh, hidden uh, photography, or the contrary. It's a very official uh, bureau of uh, press de l'Elysée who uh, show President Macron during a night, a cold night, uh, talking to poverty. Here, they are invisible. Poverty is becoming invisible. And the invisibility of poverty gives possibility to the President Macron to put himself as a uh, King Tomatur. I speak to you, you are less poor. And doing that, it's kind of last show, or it's kind of resp false response, wrong response to the real demand. And that creates populism because making clearance that he helps the most poor, let the middle, let the center of the society without response. And at this moment, there is real danger, there is real danger for power to make invisible or to make to not see the real demands of the French people as in 1789, as in 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pierre. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that the Cahiers uh, are, 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 are endlessly rich and that you have reminded us of that. Um, they're wonderful documents and I'm glad that the last word has not been spoken. Um, well, I'm going to I'm going to launch the question and answer session uh, by reminding people how to ask questions. There are two ways of asking Professor Serna questions. Uh, the first way is by submitting um, a, uh, submitting your question in writing to the host. That is the H France uh, person on your chat uh, on your chat function. Send H France uh, via chat your question. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be given that question and I'll read it for you. Or if you would prefer to, to come on screen and ask your question yourself, uh, you can do that too. Uh, but to do that, uh, you, have to inform, um, you have to inform H France that you do have a question that you want to ask in person. Um, and uh, after a brief um, check of your identity, uh, you will be given authorization and, and, and put in line, and you will be told when your time comes uh, to unmute your speaker and put on your video. Um, so please send your questions however way you, you choose to do it to H France. Um, but I'm going to start with a question. Um, I've, I've spent um, some time looking at Cahiers. Uh, I, I admit the, the published archive parlementaire kind of cahier that, that are easily accessible, especially now. Um, but um, I find that um, many of them contain, uh, contain dozens of articles on topics that, uh, that appear boring, dry, technical, obscure, and even incomprehensible. Um, things like um, uh, proximity of notaries comes up a lot. Uh, the droit de contrôle, the, the receveur de consignation, the various uh, matters having to do with hypothèque, and all sorts of local droit, local rights um, that, you know, uh, without historical dictionary, you wouldn't even know what what the people were talking about. And and many of these, I'll try to make this quicker. Many of these very dry technical sorts of questions, they don't seem to have any obvious connection with the kinds of issues like liberty and equality, or slavery, or colonies, or whatever. Uh, that that modern readers 
uh, would A, be interested in reading, and that B, we all think are important. Nonetheless, I'm still struck when I look at the Cahiers that, um, that they are full of things that mattered to people at the time that seem to us utterly arcane, boring, dry. What do we do with those things? And more specifically, how did you choose to include certain certain of Cahiers and not others? Uh, Est-ce que, est que je peux répondre en français, uh, Rafe? Oui, oui, ça, oui, oui, allez. Merci. Euh, bon, c'est bien, c'est bien, bien évident. Euh, plus on descend euh, dans les cahiers, euh, dans la grande collection des cahiers édités par euh, Jean Jaurès, euh, département par département, et plus on est en face de euh, demandes qui sont très techniques et qui sont, qui relèvent en réalité euh, de droits euh, qui sont parfois euh, redevable d'un seul village. Donc, euh, je crois que euh, effectivement, euh, on est dans cette euh, ce que j'ai tenté d'exprimer, c'est-à-dire que euh, plus on est près du, cari, du cahier de la paroisse, plus on est en face d'une réalité qui nous échappe parce qu'elle est locale. Mais euh, justement, j'ai dit aussi que euh, ce n'était pas parce que euh, on était en face de discours comme le discours sur le droit de consignation, sur le droit d'arrêtage, sur le droit euh, de et sur le droit d'hypothèque, qu'on était beaucoup moins sur des prises de conscience politique qui renvoyaient à des débats euh, philosophiques. C'est-à-dire que pour ces gens-là, je crois que il n'y a pas besoin ou euh, ce n'est pas du tout leur problème que les grands concepts euh, de l'esclavage. Enfin, quoi que. On a vu que dans un village des Pyrénées, ils disaient on ne veut pas être les esclaves du Seigneur. Donc je crois que c'est notre travail à nous d'historiens de, euh, de pouvoir aussi traduire, c'est-à-dire interpréter ce qui se cache derrière euh, un demande de droit d'hypothèque, euh, un droit de pâturage, un droit d'enclosure, euh, un droit de glanage, euh, un droit euh, de consignation, euh, un droit de préemption. Euh, qui renvoie en fait à euh, ce que l'on pourrait euh, classifier euh, sous forme de euh, liberté fondamentale. Et euh, ce qui est aussi intéressant euh, par rapport à ta question, alors comment euh, j'ai fait Bien évidemment, euh, c'était un livre donc, qui était euh, limité dans le nombre de pages qui m'étaient euh, imposées, mais euh, j'ai euh, tout de même essayé de jouer sur euh, la double dialectique de différence et répétition. Euh, C'est-à-dire que j'étais en face euh, de discours euh, conservateurs ou d'un discours qui consistait à dire, à partir des travaux de Régine Robin, qui sont très importants sur ce mur en, ex, en Auxois, la grande thèse de, de Régine Robin, qui a été la première grande historienne à euh, travailler sur euh, euh, les mots euh, des euh, cahiers de doléances, et qui euh, cherchait, à la suite de Georges Lefebvre et des grandes peurs, une carte de la répétabilité des arguments pour montrer les formes d'influence qu'avaient pu avoir certains cahiers. Et donc, j'ai euh, accepté euh, cette forme de méthode. Mais j'ai aussi travaillé sur ce que j'appellerais des exceptions heureuses. C'est-à-dire, lorsqu'il y avait des formes de répétition, mais dans ces répétitions, quelque chose qui différait, alors c'était pour moi la preuve que quelqu'un avait dit au sein de la communauté, on accepte la matrice, on accepte le modèle, mais on voudrait rajouter spécifiquement pour notre paroisse tel élément qui nous particularise par rapport à l'ensemble des demandes qui vont être synthétisées. Donc c'est un petit peu... Euh, euh, ce qui a motivé mon choix, à partir des huit volumes, à partir de la collection de tous les départements que nous connaissons euh, et que nous avons, l'Institut d'Histoire de la Révolution française, que tu connais, et puis à partir d'un euh, courrier que j'ai envoyé à tous les euh, conservateurs des archives départementales de France pour leur demander où ils en étaient de la numérisation. Bon, alors là, ça a été euh, plus ou moins selon leur réponse que j'ai pu... Euh, 
choisir les, euh, les exemples et euh, dont j'ai fait, euh, euh, fait la carte, puisque euh, les exemples euh, ont permis de faire, je ne sais pas si c'est visible, cette carte euh, qui euh, est euh, de, de l'espace français que j'ai pu. Euh, Merci, merci. merci. Um, we're having a, we're having a little, I'm having a little trouble. Uh, you're, you're kind of freezing up, but um, uh, I'm not sure if that's my, my trouble or yours or, or what, but um, that, merci. Um, we, uh, we have um, a question uh, next from Peter McPhee, who's going to come on screen and ask it himself. And then we have a, will be followed by a written question from Vivian Gruder that I'll read out. Uh, bonjour, Pierre. Bonjour, Peter. It's very nice to see you. Thank you very much for your paper. Uh, I completely agree with you about the importance of the cahier, uh, their great richness. And I think it's a very significant moment in uh, 1789. The point that uh, I want to, to make is that we need to remember that uh, the parishes of France, the Third Estate, was not asked whether it wanted a revolution. It was simply being asked what were its grievances. Um, and I think that makes the cahier even more radical because for many people in small communities, Uh, it was very dangerous to be so outspoken, um, such as that cahier from the, the Pyrenees that you referred to, from the little village of uh, Sarabonne. Uh, it was often very dangerous to be outspoken about um, grievances in such a radical way. So I think it's worthwhile uh, underlining that uh, we really need to understand that these people were taking a great risk in making these demands and that they are all the more radical for that reason. Oui, merci Peter, c'était vraiment une très 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 euh, une remarque très très juste et c'est une très forte remarque que tu fais. Je suis complètement d'accord avec toi et je suis tellement d'accord avec toi que je dirais que c'est pour ça que je dis que Louis XVI n'est pas en position de faiblesse comme on l'a toujours dit euh, c'est la dernière possibilité ou c'est l'effondrement euh, la révolution est au bord du pays. Je crois qu'on on peut le dire de façon complètement différente et qui va dans ton sens. Euh, je pense que euh, les, les gens vivent dans l'insécurité à ce moment-là. Les gens vivent dans l'insécurité à ce moment-là et je crois que ce qu'ils demandent, c'est de la sécurité. Ils ne demandent pas du tout une révolution. C'est bien clair. Non seulement ils ne demandent pas la révolution, mais ils ne veulent pas la révolution. Mais alors, je dirais peut-être autre chose par rapport à toi c'est qu'ils ne veulent pas la révolution parce que je crois qu'ils sont en train de la vivre. C'est-à-dire qu'à ce moment-là, il y a quand même beaucoup de troubles. Euh, si tu regardes les graphiques de Jean-Nicolas, depuis 1785, euh, il y a vraiment des violences. Euh, c'est en train d'augmenter en termes de blessés, euh, d'augmentation de, euh, de confrontations, euh, non seulement par... Euh, massification des oppositions dans les villages, dans les petites villes, mais dans les grandes villes. Donc, je dirais que je suis tellement d'accord avec toi que les états généraux ou les cahiers de doléances sont une demande pour pacifier le royaume. À mon avis, nous sommes tous dans une pure mythographie euh, largement construite par les révolutionnaires, puis par la Troisième République, qui consiste à dire le début de la Révolution, c'est le 14 juillet 1789. Moi, je ne le crois pas du tout. Euh, si tu regardes le très beau livre de Jean-Pierre Gessen, que tu connais bien, euh, si euh, on regarde euh, d'autres ouvrages qui euh, euh, ont, ont marqué euh, le début euh, des années euh, 60, euh, pour beaucoup d'historiens, euh, si tu lis Edgar Ford, donc euh, « La disgrâce de Turgot », le pays est dans un état de quasi-révolution depuis le début des années 1780. Et donc, je dirais, le, je dirais avec toi que les cahiers de doléances sont une possibilité d'imaginer la fin 
de ce que les gens vivent comme le risque d'une révolution. Bien sûr, ça va se passer différemment. Et c'est là que le grand livre de Tim explique comment on devient « becoming » révolutionnaire. Mais il est clair que c'est pour inventer un nouvel ordre public, donc une pacification de la rébellion permanente, que les cahiers sont si intéressants. Parce qu'ils sont la preuve de la prise de conscience, comme tu le dis, que même dans des petits villages de Pyrénées, on redoutait la révolution, parce qu'on savait bien que s'il y avait révolution, il y avait un départ incontrôlable de désordre qui allait tout mettre sans dessus dessous. Donc oui, je suis tout à fait d'accord avec toi. Um, thank, thank you, Professor McPhee. Uh, now I'm going to read a question from Vivian Gruder, um, and this is what she writes. I appreciate that Professor Serna emphasizes what I would call the lived experience of the French, and I would like to focus on that in a particular way. Professor Serna mentioned taxes, and in particular, Calonne's tax reforms. For that began, began the opening to revolution. In response to demands for tax reforms, the French, through the Assembly of Notables, demanded control over government finances. And that control should be exercised through forms of participation, initially through provincial administrations, a form of decentralization that Professor Serna mentioned. And then the issue came up in late 1788, how the national estates general should be organized. And that brought to the fore the question of the representation of the different orders in France. In short, this is to say that what takes place in 1789 had its immediate origins in the fiscal political issues raised in 1787, 1788, which have been overlooked. Um, and, and I think really the, the, the question, if I, if, if, I can, if, if I can add a little something, is what is the relationship, how do you see the relationship between those political struggles uh, that, that Professor Gruder mentions of, of 1787-88, the pré-révolution, the pré and, uh, and then the cahier, and then the, the revolution uh, itself? Oui, merci beaucoup, professeur Rodeur, de cette question-là, et merci de ton éclairage, Rafe. Et ce que, ce, ça, cela me permet de continuer, euh, si vous en êtes d'accord, de, de proposer, euh, si, bon, si, les, si les historiens servent à quelque chose, c'est évidemment à essayer de repenser des formes de, de chronorythme, chrono, euh, chrono des formes de chronorythme euh, nouveau. Euh, comme je l'ai dit, et, et, et la question du professeur Gauder me donne la possibilité de le dire de le, ou de, de l'affirmer, euh, ce que je pense, euh, mais ce n'est pas si original que ça, hein, euh, c'est que la France est en révolution. La France est en révolution, euh, c'est-à-dire en changement vaste de régime politique depuis bien sûr, 1787, mais j'allais dire depuis que, euh, de façon euh, complètement incroyable, incroyable, après Turgot, on a confié quand même le gouvernement de la France à un étranger, à un protestant, à un banquier qui n'est ni officier, ni commissaire, de l'État. Alors, je parle de Necker, bien sûr. Donc, ça veut donc dire, en fait, que si on accepte, et là, je renvoie à Edgar Faure, et quand on sait comment a été écrit le livre d'Edgar Faure, La disgrâce de Turgot, vous savez que c'est le jeune François Furet qui a fondamentalement pensé, organisé, administré ce livre-là. C'est-à-dire, le talent de François Furet, quand il pense quand il aide Edgar Ford à écrire La disgrâce de Turgot, qui montre la conclusion d'Edgar de, de, Ford, c'est que la vraie révolution, ce n'est pas 
1789, et c'est 1775. La révolte des farines est une révolution manquée, mais c'est déjà le premier acte de la révolution. Et ce premier acte de la révolution, il se joue sur la réforme ratée des corporations, qui était la suite de la réforme ratée de la fiscalité du coup de Mopo. Donc, je pense que euh, pour aller dans votre sens, et pour nuancer ce que dit euh, Rafe, mais qui reprend l'expression de Jean Aigret, la pré-révolution, à mon avis, euh, nous sommes euh, enfermés dans les mots. Nous sommes enfermés dans les mots. Ce n'est pas une pré-révolution. Je pense qu'il y a une vraie révolution, et Talon le, le sait bien. Et je crois que euh, la, la, la vraie pré-révolution se joue sur la double euh, dimension du politique et du fiscal. Elle se joue sur la double dimension de, du politique et du fiscal. Et on le voit bien encore aujourd'hui sur les, les, les questions de décentralisation et les questions euh, d'autonomie des régions et les questions des aptitudes des régions à pouvoir euh, commander elles-mêmes les dépenses. En 1787, l'Assemblée des notables échoue euh, pour deux raisons. Fuse, ce qui me semble être la partie invisible de l'iceberg de l'histoire de la France, c'est-à-dire l'histoire régionalo-fédéralo-girondino-décentralisée française, une histoire impossible de France, mais une histoire qui a constamment été souterraine à l'histoire officielle. Le pouvoir central refuse cette administration locale que Necker avait commencé dans le Berry et la Guyenne, dans la tentative d'organiser des États provinciaux. Et d'ailleurs, Turgot le comprend très bien, qui dit, mais si on lit les deux, les deux possibilités, c'est-à-dire celle de l'administration locale et celle de la levée des impôts, alors la France devient autant de républiques qu'il y aura de généralité. Turgot le comprend très très bien. Turgot comprend très bien en fait que c'est une transformation radicale et que c'est une républicanisation du régime qui est en train de se jouer. Mais de l'autre côté, les notables vont utiliser le prétexte du refus de la décentralisation parce que eux mêmes sentent bien, et surtout les nobles et le clergé, qu'ils devraient payer des impôts. Et c'est là que, à mon avis, on est dans une révolution parce qu'il y a pression internationale. Il ne faut jamais, à mon avis, oublier, et dans cette question du professeur Gouder, euh, illustrée par Rafe, il ne faut pas oublier que 1787 est encore plus dramatique parce que le traité commercial avec l'Angleterre a été signé en 1786. Et le traité est en train de désorganiser totalement l'industrie textile française, l'industrie en fait manufacturée française. Et donc, il y a là aussi une sorte de désorganisation qui provoque un désordre économique qui, lui aussi, est facteur de désordre politique et d'un système d'instabilité qui fait qu'on est en train de passer dans un moment de rébellion permanente à cause du chômage institutionnalisé, et que cette rébellion permanente est déjà, pour, pour les contemporains qui le vivent, il suffit de voir les occurrences, maintenant on peut le voir grâce aux numérisations, aux océrisations des textes, est déjà euh, la, révolution, euh, la révolution en marche. De telle sorte que euh, je poursuis, et j'insiste sur le fait que je pense que 1789 était pour Louis XVI un moment crucial pour arrêter ce qu'il comprenait être une révolution déjà commencée. Ben, J'espère que j'ai répondu. Yes, yeah, very yes, thank you. That's uh, that that's very fascinating. Um, uh, I have a question for you from Jeremy Popkin, um, who asks about the act of the the act of writing a cahier. What meant to someone to write a cahier? He asks, was it really a risk to compile a cahier? After all, the king had authorized everyone to express so. Was there any danger in stepping forward and signing or 
signing a cahier and taking part in, in that exercise? Um, c'est un exercice qui euh, ne m'a pas semblé être suivi de la moindre recherche de police dans les cahiers que j'ai vus, enfin pour moi euh, ceux qui étaient euh, signés, lorsqu'on a pu euh, avoir des remontées des archives départementales, euh, les cahiers étaient soit signés collectivement, soit signés euh, individuellement, euh, aucun cahier euh, n'était... Euh, m'a semblé être l'objet de, de poursuites, pour la bonne et simple raison qu'aucun cahier n'était euh, insultant. Euh, en revanche, quand même, en revanche, quand même euh, je me souviens avoir vu un cahier de Grasse, euh, une petite ville de ce qui va devenir les Alpes-Maritimes, donc euh, sur la bordure du, du Var, que tu connais bien, euh, Raif. Euh, là, euh, les gens de Grasse menacent le roi, menacent le roi d'une révolution. C'est-à-dire qu'il euh, rappelle au roi euh, qu'il ne peut plus légiférer seul. Là, ce qui les intéresse, c'est en fait euh, l'idée de la législation. Ils disent qu'ils veulent participer euh, à la législation. Et euh, dans ce cahier, qui est un des plus radicaux que j'ai lu, parce qu'il y a un appel euh, en disant que c'est une claire menace, donc là, euh, l'hypothèse de Jérémy, euh, que je remercie de cette question, pourrait être vérifiée, euh, le cahier n'est pas signé. Euh, le cahier, euh, là, euh, n'est pas signé. Donc, est-ce qu'il n'est pas signé parce que euh, c'était euh, un cahier vraiment où il y avait une quasi-menace pour le roi, ou une injonction pour le roi de faire les lois, euh, de rédiger les lois avec tous, je n'en sais rien. Euh, en attendant, euh, je ne connais pas de euh, menace de ce type-là. En revanche, et je crois que Jérémy me pose cette question parce que, il est un grand érudit de la Révolution française et son très beau livre qui vient de faire paraître le montre. Les vraies demandes dangereuses ne sont pas dans les cahiers. C'est-à-dire que parallèlement aux cahiers, et Jérémy en est un des spécialistes mondiaux et il le sait bien, il y a toute une production littéraire de pamphlets, d'écrits, d'éditions, de petits livres, à la feuille de, 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 de livres qui correspondent à la demande, à la dynamique des demandes et qui ne sont pas signés. Bon, par exemple, celui que je connais le mieux, c'est bien sûr le catéchisme du tiers état qui n'est pas signé d'Antonelle et qui est en fait un écrit de 18 pages sous la forme d'un catéchisme, question, demande, question, euh, question, réponse, question, réponse, et qui est d'une radicalité extrême, euh, quelques semaines avant l'apparition du « Qu'est-ce que le tiers état » de CIS, euh, qui euh, demande très clairement euh, l'abolition de la noblesse ou l'exclusion, l'exclusion de la nation, euh, de la noblesse, si elle ne se conforme pas euh, aux demandes du, euh, du, du peuple. Alors là, il peut y avoir des poursuites. Là, il peut y avoir des, des, des saisies d'édition, de, voire des, la censure ne fonctionne plus très bien, mais en attendant, des saisies chez les imprimeurs d'écrits. Donc, ce n'est pas dans les signatures des cahiers qu'on retrouve le risque, mais beaucoup plus dans les, dans les, dans les, dans les imprimés. Many thanks, Pierre. Um, we are uh, we are going to uh, bring this session to a close now, unless there are, uh, is a, 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 a further question. But um, uh, if not, uh, I'd like to thank you uh, on behalf of everybody else um, for for your presentation and your really extensive, interesting uh, answers, um, and all in. Uh, all in English. Uh, very, it was a great pleasure. Thank you. Merci. Merci à tous. Au revoir.